On this edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at Become a Servant. Jesus in the Gospel of Mark chapter 10 says, For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is the suffering servant prophesied in Isaiah. Jesus is the servant. And if we want to be like Christ, we need to be servants ourselves. So do you ever wonder what life is all about? Do you ever wonder, like, what am I doing here? What's the purpose of life? What's the meaning of life? Do you sometimes find yourself thinking like Koheleth? You just heard about Koheleth. What does Koheleth say? Vanity of vanities in, in Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities, says Koheleth. Vanity of vanities, all things are vanity. What profit have we from all the toil which we toil at under the sun? He goes on in verse 14. I have seen all things that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a chase after the wind. Is he right? Or is he just having a bad day? Or maybe, again, this wisdom literature is right in the middle of the Bible. Is there kind of a, a kind of a prophetic pointing that Kaheleth recognizes that there's got to be more. There's, there's a light that we're waiting for to bring light into the meaning of life, the purpose, our identity. And we know, of course, that the light did come. In John's Gospel, John says in verse 9, chapter 1, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. That's what Koheleth, I think, was, he might have not realized it, but was, was longing for. I need light. I need light so that I can understand what's the point of all of this. If we just work in, under the sun for 60, 70, 80 years and then die and forgotten. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so as Christians, brothers and sisters, we do have a certain clarity, a light about what this is all about. Again, the meaning of life, the purpose in life. Now, we don't have things completely figured out because that would be boring. If we had everything figured out, our lives would be boring. This world wouldn't be a wonderful world. What makes life wonderful? What makes our world wonderful? It's the fact that it is mysterious. There's, a, there's an element of mystery. It's bigger than we are. You know, kind of like women. They say women are mysterious. I agree. You heard the story of the guy who's really holy, talked to God all the time. God was so pleased with him one day. God appeared and said, my son, you've been so faithful, I want to grant you one wish. And immediately the, the man said, well, you know, I've always dreamed of going Hawaii, to Hawaii my whole life, but I'm afraid of flying, so could you build a bridge from North America over to Hawaii? And God said, wow, gee, I mean, I can do that, obviously, but usually I like to work in more hidden ways. Like, are you sure there's nothing else you want? And then the man thought, and he said, well, I've never understood women. They're so mysterious. I never know what you're thinking. Could you make it that I understand women? And God said, did you want a two- or four-lane bridge? <laughs> yeah, you've all heard that one before. I'm just trying to cheer you up. So life is mysterious, but again, the Lord, He gives us a light. He doesn't want us to, to just think that life is pointless, you know? Who, he who dies with the most toys w wins, you know? That's not what life is all about. Life isn't all about, you know, achieving perfect comfort, security, eat, drink, and be merry. It's more than that. What I want to do this morning is I want to share with you just five different images, five different images that that describes who we are. Five images that describes our purpose in life, what we're here for. Number one, each one of us is a lover. We're made to love. Again, if anyone ever asks or if you're ever wondering, you know, what's my purpose in life? What's the meaning of life all about? The most direct, the most clear answer 
Jesus gives when he's asked what the greatest commandment is in Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 36. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. These are the most important. This is what it's all about. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment or which are the greatest commandments? That's the same as asking, who am I? Why am I here? What was I made for? What was I made for? We know that fish were made to swim. Birds were made to fly. Monkeys were made to climb trees. As human beings, we were made to love more than anything else. Who made us? We were made by God. God is love. We were made by love. Why did God make us? Did he make us because he had, has needs? No, God is completely sufficient in himself. God made us, love made us out of love. What did he make us for? Because he had kind of a project he needed done? No, He made us simply to receive his love and hopefully reciprocate his love. We were made by love, out of love, for love. That's our identity. That's the meaning of life. That's the purpose. That's what we're here for. It's the most important thing. We're lovers. We're made for love. We will not be happy unless we love. Just like a fish isn't happy unless it's swimming. We will not be happy unless we love. You know, it's a beautiful thing. Sometimes I meet grandparents. You know, a couple, a husband and a wife. And it seems obvious that they still love each other as much, maybe even more, than when they were first married. It's a beautiful thing when you come across that. And they love their children. They spend a lot of their energy helping their children with whatever the children need help with, babysitting, fixing the car, you know, taking care of the house. It's like a full-time job for them, but they're happy to serve their children because they love their children. They're so proud of them. But their pride and joy is their grandchildren. That's what they talk about all the time. Have you met grandparents like that? All they talk about is their grandchildren, how adorable they are, how wonderful they are. Some are even blessed to have great-grandchildren. And this is a beautiful thing. You know, people, people like this, couples like this, grandparents like this, You know, they don't spend a lot of time confused about what the meaning of life is because they're living it, they're loving. They're doing what they were made to do and it feels right. And it's most perfect when these grandparents love God first. When they're deeply in love with God, committed to God, surrendered to God, devoted to God. Now that's a beautiful thing. To be devoted to God, to love God first and to love their family And what's best, super best, is when they also love their enemies and when they care for the poor and the forgotten. Well, there you have it. You've you've arrived if you've come to that place. To love, we're made for love. That's what the meaning of life is. That's who we are. So number one image, we're lovers above all. But there's more to it than that. We're also warriors, brothers and sisters. We are in a battle. We have an enemy who hates us and wants to destroy us. We do not have any choice. No one can be neutral in this battle. I don't care if you're from Switzerland. You're still going to be attacked. Every one of us is meant to fight this battle. If we don't fight the battle, we're destroyed. You can't be neutral in this battle. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, he says, Be sober and vigilant. Your opponent, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him steadfast in your faith. Again, Scripture is very clear. There is a battle going on, and each one of us is implied in that battle, whether we like it or not. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 11, put on the armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the tactics of the devil. For our struggle is not with flesh and blood, but with the principalities, with the powers, with the world rulers, with this present darkness, with the evil spirits in the heavens. 
The battle isn't against fellow human beings because fellow human beings are our brothers and sisters. The battle is against the forces of darkness and this battle is within. Every one of us has to fight this battle. And the truth is, is that our eternal destiny is at stake. It's a very serious battle that each one of us is called to. In the Old Testament, there's all these battle scenes, you know, these stories of battles. There's just battles and battles and battles. And this is a reminder to us that each one of us is called to be a warrior king. Do you see yourself as a warrior king? You should, because that's what you are. That's what you're meant to be in this life. Some people think, oh yeah, well Jesus, he was kind of, he lightened things up. No, he didn't. Jesus, even with more gravity, with more severity, proclaimed to us that there is a battle going on for your immortal soul. You have an enemy. Jesus didn't water it down at all. He brought it to the next level. He made that clear to us, this battle going on within. It's a daily battle. Every one of us, every day, fights with temptation. We deal with temptation. We deal with our little addictions and maybe our big addictions. Every day, the battle never ends. The Lord strengthens us for the battle. Scripture says the joy of the Lord is our strength. The enemy wants into our souls and into our hearts. And he knows the weakest walls is our fallen passions. Our fallen passions. Anger, gluttony, greed, pride, lust laziness, envy, the deadly sins. Those are our weakest walls. And the anim- enemy will, will attack us in, the, in these areas. Um, and we need, to be, we need to be aware of that. We will continue with the teaching by Father Mark in just a moment. The Food for Life ministry is only made possible by the financial donations from you, our viewers. We ask that after the program, you prayerfully consider a tax-deductible financial donation to help us continue this Catholic television ministry. To save postage, you may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. Thank you for your prayers and support. And now back to Father Mark Goring. As children of God, by essence, we were created to be free. To be a child of God, to be made in the image and likeness of God is to be free. But the devil does not want us to be free. We are meant to have dominion over our souls so we can come under the dominion of the king of kings. But the enemy wants to come in and he wants to kick us off our throne and he wants to have dominion in our lives. He wants to take away our freedom. He wants to make us slaves. Some of us have experienced that. We know that's true. Maybe some of us are struggling with that right now. All of us are struggling with it to a degree. But again, this is the battle that we're up against. We must fight and we must never abandon our post. Again, a warrior, a soldier who's given a post must never abandon it. Many people struggle with with suicidal thoughts sometimes. If you struggle with these things, tell the devil, I will not leave my post. I will stand and fight till my dying breath. Every single one of us. No matter how fierce the battle, I will fight till the bitter end because I'm a warrior king and I will have dominion over my soul till I die so I can give it to the Lord for eternity. And so again, this is our call. Scripture says, He who perseveres to the end will be saved. Scripture also says, Jesus tells us in Scripture over and over again, Stay awake. Stay awake like a good soldier. Don't fall asleep. Stay awake. And we want it with St. Paul to be able to end our life saying, I have fought the good fight. I have run the race. And so again, we're lovers and we're also warriors. But a third image, we're also dancers. Life is serious. The war, the war is serious. But there's also a lightness to this life, and we better know that. There's a, a playfulness to this life, a fun to this life, and we should know that. Life is good. It's a blessing. It's meant to be enjoyed. It's a gift. One of my favorite Catholic philosophers, Peter Kreeft, great Catholic philosopher, just 
beautiful um, ability to, to proclaim, to teach the, the, the truths of reality uh, in a remarkable way. He said one day in his, in his university office, a, a, a young first-year student came to see him. And this first-year student was all kind of beside himself because he was discovering philosophy and all these truths and reality and the great thinkers and all of this. And he was just having this major awakening or whatever. And he's all kind of serious and caught up in philosophy. And he, he, he's in Peter Kreef's office. And Peter Kreef has all the great works of all the great thinkers, you know, on his bookshelf. And, and, and the, the boy asked Peter Kreef, he says, you know, professor, like, what's, what's it all about ultimately? And Peter Kreef goes into his closet and he takes out a surfboard. And he says, he says, this is what it's all about. And he was trying to tell the guy, listen, dude, lighten up, you know. It's great that you've discovered truth and all of that. But again, life is a gift that's meant to be enjoyed. And Peter Kreef goes on to talk about, again, being the philosopher he is. He says, the ocean is an image of God. You know, creation reflects the creator. The ocean is an image of God. You look and there's no end to it. It's like it's infinite and it's big and it's powerful, but it's also beautiful. And Peter Kreef says it's the surfer's who perfectly exemplify what God wants us to do. He doesn't just want us to kind of put our toes in the water and say, oh, wasn't that nice? No, he wants us to run in. Run into that ocean with your surfboard and play in the waves. And so too in this life, again, the Lord wants us to dance. He wants us to enjoy the gift of life. And again, the image of life being a dance, you know, many of the great great, um, spiritual masters have, have spoken about this, that again, God is a lover. He's a lover. He, he woos us. He, want, he blesses us. And he wants us to respond just like a couple uh, dancing together. You know, we're children of God. Let's not forget that. Sometimes we take ourselves too seriously. We're God's little children. And any parent wants to see his or her children happy, ecstatically happy. And that's what God wants to see in us. So again, not only should we enjoy life, it's a sin not to enjoy life. Some people say, oh, you know, when I'm judged, you know, the Lord's going to say, you stole and you lied and you, you know, you cheated. Well, the Lord might start by saying, man, you didn't have any fun. I gave you the gift of life. I gave you so many gifts, so many blessings, so many opportunities. And what did you do with it? Nothing. You buried it. Are you enjoying life? Are you enjoying this gift that God has given? Another truth is if we don't fill our life with wonderful good things, sin will come and try to fill our life instead. You better fill your life with wonderful, good, holy, wholesome, fun things, things that are of God. You know, some of you have swimming pools. I won't ask for a show of hands because we'll all be envious. When was the last time you went for a swim in your swimming pool? Enjoy it. Some of you have boats. When was the last time you went out boating? Was your your boat sitting in your backyard for the last two years? Shame on you. (laughs) Give it to a poor family that would use it every weekend if that's what you're doing. You know? How many, of, how many of you you people, some of you love to bake, and you haven't baked cookies for a long time? Bake some cookies. You might say, well, I don't have anyone to bake cookies for. Father David loves cookies. <laughs> He'll eat all your cookies. The saints, the saints danced. The saints danced. St. Francis of Assisi danced for joy. St. Philip and Neri danced for joy. David danced before the ark. The holy, the holy of holies, he danced in the presence of God. The Lord wants us to dance for joy. So again, let's, again we need to take the Lord seriously, but, but as, as a parent, in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus says, Do not be afraid any longer, little flock, for your Father is pleased to give you the kingdom. As children of God, we're his children. We shouldn't have a servile fear. We should have a filial fear and love. The, 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 the fear of not wanting to offend our loving Father, not a servile fear. So again, we're lovers, we're warriors, we're dancers. But number four, we're also mountain climbers. This is a classic image in the spiritual life, the climb, the ascent. Scripture, Psalm 24, Who shall climb the mountain of the Lord? Each one of us is called to grow in holiness. 
Each one of us is called to the heights of holiness and virtue, to union with God. Each one of us, and again, the, the image, it's, 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 an, it's, an, it's an analogy, the image of the mountain. The higher you are on the mountain, the closer you are to the heavens. And that's where God lives. And the Lord wants us to become less and less worldly, less and less of this world, and more and more like Christ, more and more heavenly. And this, this, this ascent is, is ultimately, it's, it's God's work, but we cooperate. So we're not talking about, you know, acquiring tons of human virtue through our own efforts and works. It's more than that. It's the work of God, and we dispose ourselves to it. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek what is above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Think about what is above, not what is on earth. And in John chapter 17, beginning in verse 15, Jesus says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world any more than I belong to the world. And that's where we get the expression, to be in the world, but not of the world. And again, the Lord calls us to to rise higher and higher, closer and closer to Him, and to become less and less attached to the things of this world. Because of the things of this world, they're wonderful, but they're passing away. And so again, the Lord calls us to this climb. Um, Pope Benedict, Emeritus, I guess, Pope Benedict, he, for, he said for him, the image of climbing the mountain was a primary image in his own spiritual walk. St. John of the Cross, the great uh, doctor of the church, uh, wrote the ascent of Mount Carmel, this idea that every day I keep climbing. And when you climb a mountain, it, it's a little more work. It's a little more work going uphill than going downhill. We all know that. G- uh, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, chapter 7, verse 13, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road broad or easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter through it are many. How narrow the gate and constricted the road that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Other translations say how hard the road. And again, we know that if we want to grow in virtue, if we want the joy of the Lord to live in us, if we want to be the men and women God has called us to be, it requires a struggle. It requires a climb. And the truth is, is when we're going through the hardest points in our life, we're ascending the fastest if we're doing it in union with God. So again, the image of every day I walk up and I continue to climb. I continue to climb the hard road that leads to life. The last image is the image of the servant. Number five, the servant. Jesus in the Gospel of Mark chapter 10 says, For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is the suffering servant prophesied in Isaiah. Jesus is the servant. And if we want to be like Christ, we need to be servants ourselves. We need to identify ourselves as a servant, like the Hispanic community here. You, you know, they come up to me and say, you know, soy una servidora. I'm a servant. They see themselves that they're involved in ministry or anything. They call themselves a servant. That's a beautiful thing. Each one of us should identify ourselves as a servant. I'm a servant. That's who I am. That's my identity. I'm here to serve. I remember when I was first ordained a priest, I was going through this time where I was trying to figure out, Lord, what do you want of me as a priest? You know, and we were taught about our gifts and our charisms. And, you know, and some priests have special uh, ministries and apostles. And I'm thinking, Lord, what do you want me to focus and emphasize? And as I'm worrying and thinking about this, I felt the Lord saying, just be quiet and serve. That's all I want you to do. Serve, okay? Serve. And when the Lord gave me this word, there was just this tremendous freedom. There's a simplicity in simply having, simply serving. And since, since then, that's been my main priority. You know, my first assignment was at St. Mary's in Ottawa. I tried to serve as best I could. That's it. Then I was vocations director. I served. I did the best I could. Then I was at York University. I served. I'm trying to serve here. What am I here to do? I'm here to serve. Not to get caught up in myself, my own ego and ambitions and whatever else. I'm here to serve. Simple as that. Jesus got on his knees, he took off his outer garments, he washed his disciples' feet. If it's good enough for him, it's got to be good enough for me. So again, each one of us, 
we need to see ourselves as a servant. And not just in the great moments where people will see and acknowledge us, but in those, those hidden tasks, those simple little hidden tasks to serve because we serve God in everything. A servant. Each one of us call, is called to a servant. Again, we want to we wanna hear the words of the Lord when our life ends. Well done, good and faithful servant. All I want to do is serve. And so there's five images, brothers and sisters. We're lovers. We're warriors. We're dancers. We're mountain climbers. And we're servants. That's what life is all about. That's, that's, that's what the Lord calls us to. That's, that's what the Lord's light reveals us to. It's not, life isn't just vanity of vanities. We have a purpose. Following Christ is a great adventure. We're involved in something great. So let's live our lives in a way worthy of the children of God. For an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Mark Goring on Become a Servant, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. When you write, ask for an audio CD or video DVD of program 1757. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at You Need God. Some of our professors insisted, they said, you study theology. You study the faith on your knees. This isn't just an intellectual game. If, you're, if you want to study the things of God, you need God. You need to be listening to His voice. And so they told us, study on your knees. For an audio CD or video DVD of today's ministry, we invite you to write to us. When you write, mention the program number 1757 and today's topic, Father Mark Goring on Become a Servant. Food for Life is a nonprofit Catholic charity funded only by donations from viewers. To help us continue this Catholic television ministry, please send your tax deductible donation to Food for Life. Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. To save postage, you may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. We ask you to consider a regular monthly donation, either by post-dated checks or through our website, to help fulfill the Great Commission from Matthew 28:19. Go and make disciples of all nations. If you have never donated before, we ask that you make your check payable to Food for Life. And our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. Thanks to your faithful prayers and tax-deductible financial support, Food for Life is the longest-running Catholic television program in Canada. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at You Need God. Some of our professors insisted, they said, you study theology. You study the faith on your knees. This isn't just an intellectual game. If, you're, if you want to study the things of God, you need God. You need to be listening to His voice. And so they told us, study on your knees. We would like to thank you for your financial support of the Food for Life television ministry. Food for Life is funded only by viewers like yourself. We have no commercial sponsors. Your tax-deductible donations help pay for production of the program, pay the television station for the time that the program is on the air, and pay for the mailing of our monthly newsletter. Thank you again for your support of this Catholic television ministry.